welcome everybody to, I guess this is our first rounds of 2024 because we didn't have one in January. Uh, I'm Lori Burroughs. I'm the Associate Director of the IIDR. And I'm really excited today to introduce our speakers. So the first speaker is Dr. Jacqueline Wong. She is a staff physician and assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics and the Division of Infectious Diseases at McMaster Children's Hospital. Her research focuses on quality improvement and patient safety. She has a specific interest in antimicrobial stewardship, including novel stewardship strategies and antibiotic associated infections. Today, she'll be speaking to us about beta lactam allergies or maybe lack thereof. <laughs> um, our second speaker is Dr. Dave Sicantha. He's a structural enzymologist who got his PhD at the University of Guelph. He is currently a CHR fellow in Jerry Wright's lab where he's been working on characterizing the mode of action of metallobetalactamase inhibitors, among other antimicrobial compounds. Uh, I'm both happy and sad to say that Dave is leaving us next month to start his own lab in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Waterloo, um, where he'll be studying beta-lactam resistance in beta bacterial cell wall homeostasis. And so today, he's going to be talking to us about resistance to and efficacy of beta-lactam antibiotics. So thank you both. Uh, I will turn it over to Jacqueline to get us get us started. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, thank you for the introduction, uh, Lori. So um, I'm going to set the stage this morning and talk a little bit about beta-lactam allergies, their impact, and tools to facilitate delabeling. Um, I have a background in um, ID, obviously in PEDS ID, and, and prior to going to med school, I trained as a pharmacist. So this is a topic that I've been like passionate and thinking about for a really long time. And uh, I just wanted to start the morning off with a shout out, um, happy Residence Awareness Week to uh, all the learners that are online with us today. And thank you so much for everything that you do to help support us and, self and help support our patients. So, um, very quickly, I have no disclosures. What I'm hoping um, you'll be able to walk away with today is uh, the, um, the knowledge to describe the burden and consequences of inaccurate beta-lactam allergy or BLA labels, outline a classification system for reactions to beta-lactam antibiotics, um, list a de and describe different approaches to beta-lactam allergy testing and to describe the evidence for direct oral challenges. Okay, so just a few stories to start the morning. Um, one of the first patients I remember um, providing care for, so this was back in 2008. This was a 50-year-old male. He was admitted to the Medsurge ICU at Toronto General Hospital, where I used to work as a pharmacist. And he was a prior kidney transplant. Um, and on his uh, med profile, it said he had an allergy to penicillin. This gentleman was, <clears throat> excuse me, intubated, sedated, and couldn't provide any more detail or history around that reaction. I tried to contact his wife, who didn't have any additional information about it, other than to say that I have no recollection of this happening since we've been married. So. I'll assume the reaction happened as a child. Um, he was admitted at that time for sus suspected sepsis. He was transferred to the ICU very quickly from the ward and um, because of his worsening clinical status. And then the treatment he received was miripenem. Another patient that comes to mind, this is fast forward to 2015. I'm in a PEDS ID fellow, but I'm doing my adult rotation at uh, Mount Sinai. And it's a 20 year old female who's admitted to the OB ward. She's um, multi-parish G9, P1. This is uh, currently, she's 33 and five weeks gestation. And she also has a reported allergy to penicillin. And I asked her a little bit more about it. And she said, uh, my mom told me that I almost died as a child. Uh, so the, and there was a there was an element of cognitive impairment, and I really couldn't um, delve into more details. Um, Mom was in another country; we couldn't get a hold of her. So she presented with um, uh, suspicion for premature rupture of membranes. She had some microbiological tests done, and she was found to be chlamydia and gonorrhea positive at that time. And so, um, what we opted to treat her with, as per the PHO guidelines at that time, um, included spectinomycin and azithromycin. 
And then most recently, 2022, 18-month-old toddler, he's admitted to CTU at uh, McMaster Children's. He has a history of recurrent ear infections and has this amoxicillin allergy. So he's had lots of ear infections and, you know, query viral illnesses leading up to the time when I meet him and received amoxicillin for it and developed this blotchy rash. Not particularly itchy, not raised, but he was told that, oh, they look like hives and you have an allergy. And so he was actually admitted in the setting of um, group A strep bacteremia. He was found to have complicated pneumonia on the right side. He required a chest tube. And while he was, and so he received chest ceftriaxone at the beginning because he didn't know the organism. The fluid PCR was positive for group A strep and they wanted to narrow. So we had the opportunity to speak to the family on the ward, discuss his beta lactam allergy. And while he was convalescing, we successfully completed a direct oral challenge on the ward and we were able to delabel him. So he was able to go home on oral amoxicillin. Literally a, less than a week later, like I saw him once in ID follow-up, like around the four week mark and less than a week later, again, cough, fever, and he was admitted um, because of this recent um, episode and he had a pneumonia on the other side and he was found to have strep pneumobacteremia. But because of this really recent intervention where we delabeled him, he was able to start on ampicillin right away for this low bar pneumonia and he was stepped down to oral amoxicillin. Okay, so I, I hope I've um, set the stage and convinced everyone that um, uh, with antibiotic allergies, it's really important that we try to clarify them more and do something about them. Even though most of us on this call probably are not allergists, we can do something about it. So um, here we go talking about beta-lactam allergies. And on, this is not to uh, downplay severe reactions, which definitely people have. So I, I hope I'm not upsetting anyone in the audience when I'm you know, using terms like allergies and, and air quotes. So there's a lot of, there are a lot of campaigns out there to raise awareness that most reported allergies are not real contraindications to receiving these medications. So 10% of the population report an allergy to penicillins. This infographic is from the Society of Infectious Diseases Pharmacists, um, but in fact, less than one out of those 10 people truly is allergic and truly can't receive it. Here's another infographic from the um, American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Similar information on their infographic. 10% of people report they're allergic. Nine out of 10 of these people can probably safely receive it. Um, and then a few more stats about what the consequences are of receiving um alternative antibiotics and, and their website, the AAAAI website has a ton of amazing resources that are geared to clinicians and um, I was gonna say families, patients as well. And then here, it's kind of like a, a, um, a cartoon depicting what happens, what we commonly see on the pediatric side anyway. So you have a young child who's prescribed penicillin for a strep throat or amoxicillin, and they develop a rash. The parent calls the prescribing doctor saying, we got a rash. And the prescribing doctor says, oh, there's a, a reaction or an allergy to this penicillin or amoxicillin. It's not witnessed by a healthcare provider, and it's certainly not tested any further. And so, you know, this is again, reinforcing what I just showed with the infographics. Um, it's self-reported. So beta-lactam allergies are self-reported by 10% of the population, um, possibly higher on the inpatient adult side and possibly lower on the pediatric side. So there was a big um, kind of a database retrospective observational study done by Jones et al. Um, using the data in one of the big um, systems that covers, I think it's 22 hospitals in Utah. Um, and they found that 8% of their admitted patients over a 10 year period had um, an allergy on their chart. It's interesting, they were able to show like over the years, over the, the age range of the children, the prevalence of allergy changes. So when you're under a year of age, less than 1% of those kids had an allergy on their chart. And then by the time they're adults or 17 years old, their prevalence reaches what we see in adulthood. Um, on the sick kids side, when I, I did a study looking at a one-year cohort, um, our prevalence was about 3%. 
Um, up to 90% of patients can safely tolerate these medications after careful assessment. And I, I'm trying to change the verbiage, like instead of after allergist assessment, careful assessment, because I think um, we all have the knowledge and the skills to actually start these conversations. Um, most labels are acquired in childhood, you know, kind of like that uh, infographic or that cartoon that I showed you uh, on the last screen. Um, the most common medication that children are prescribed in the outpatient and inpatient setting are antibiotics. And the most common indications are acute otitis media, strep throat. Those are in the top three to five um, across the board, different studies. A lot of these infections, there might be co-infection with viruses or totally due to viruses. So you can appreciate that rashes probably happen commonly either as some interaction between the antibiotic and the virus or the virus itself. Um, causes a rash. And then this rash is unwitnessed by a healthcare provider and the child gets this label and they carry this label into childhood um, and their important impact. So um, 30 to 50% of people who have this label on their chart receive a non-beta lactam alternative. And that percentage range I appreciate is quite large, depends on the, the the study that you look at. Um, some of these non-beta lactam alternatives include vancomycin, aminoglycosides, fluoroquinolones, clindamycin, carbapenems. They are broader, they're more costly, they have more side effects. Um, there's increased risk of future infections with more resistant organisms. So kind of across the board, um, there is there are huge downsides to um, having this allergy, um, getting alternative antibiotics, um, and then it affects clinical outcomes when you choose non-beta-lactam antibiotics for certain conditions. I think this data is well established for um, methicillin-susceptible staph aureus bacteremia, where using vancomycin, um, which has slower mi um, microbial activity, sorry, haven't had my full cup of coffee yet, um, higher, fa higher failure rates associated mortality and morbidity, and then surgical site infections, having a reported penicillin allergy, receiving clindamycin or vancomycin, and you're more likely to develop a skin and soft tissue infection post-surgically. This is all types of surgeries, hip surgeries, knee surgeries, C-sections, um, abdo surgeries, um, cabbage, and so like thoracic surgeries as well. I think there's more emerging data for other clinical syndromes where um, having this beta-lactam allergy, when you're being treated for a certain infection like pneumonia, you're more likely to get, um, you're more likely to receive non-beta-lactam antibiotics. Um, many other negative consequences, just by virtue of having this label on your chart, probably the mechanism is um, receiving the alternative antibiotics. So um, increased risk for infections by antibiotic resistant organisms, C. difficile, MSA, VRE come to mind, other hospital acquired infections, prolonged hospital stay, increased healthcare utilization. So that means like more likely or more visits to the eMERGE, more visits to urgent care, and then increased health costs at the end of all of this, morbidity. Um, so there's a lot of important consequences that patients might not be aware of. And certainly parents of um, their children who get these labels aren't aware of these consequences. Just doing a quick time check here. Um, what constitutes a real allergy? Because not all reactions are allergies. Some are just um, intolerances like diarrhea, um, metallic taste um, related to like metronidazole, chlorothromycin. Um, so I, I'm sure a lot of us in the audience have seen tables like this before, and I'm not gonna go through all the details, but they're, um, depending on the type of reaction, it's categorized um, into type one through to type four, um, mediated by um, different cells and um, cytotoxins in the immune system and manifesting as different symptoms and also consequences as to whether you can get this tested in the future, whether you can get the medication or whether you have to avoid everything. Um, at least on the pediatric side and, and probably on the adult side, probably the allergic reaction that people are most worried about, like when they get the rash, they're worried it's going to evolve into anaphylaxis. And so this is a rapid onset um, reaction in, usually, usually involving a dermatologic manifestation. I'd usually it's hives, it's itchy, these migratory um, swollen lesions, but in the more severe setting, you can have angioedema, um, 
and a, a hypotension, respiratory symptoms, abdo pain, vomiting. So it, it's multi-system by definition. Um, IgE mediated reaction, you can see it with all the beta lactams. Um, and the diagnosis hinges on history, skin testing, drug challenges. Um, you need medications to treat the reaction, um, but there's also conversations about avoiding the medications, avoiding medications that can cross react and maybe considering desensitization. Not to be confused, you can also have anaphylactoid reactions um, that can mimic anaphylaxis, but it's a different mechanism. So the drug directly stimulates the mast cells. Um, this is seen with vancomycin, for example, and usually antihistamines are enough to get you through the acute reaction. You would not need to do skin testing or drug challenges if you take the appropriate history and, able, and are able to discern that this is anaphylactoid. Um, this uh, figure is taken from um, an article by Kim Blumenthal and colleagues, um, just showing you the structures here. Um, the reaction for um, type 1 mediated um, reactions to beta lactams is not against the beta lactam ring. So it's technically not possible to have anaphylaxis to all beta lactams. It's really to the um, R1 or sometimes the R2 chain in cephalosporins. And so there are a lot of um, charts similar to this one um, that uh, graphically show you if you have a reported suspected type 1 allergy anaphylaxis to a particular medication, if you go across the chart, everything in white is A-OK. -okay. You can go ahead with those medicines. If it's yellow, caution, there is some structural similarity cross-reaction might happen. And then if it's a red box, then there's um, a much higher likelihood of cross-reactivity because the R1 or the R2 chain is identical. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through uh, the details of these other hypersensitivities, but class two usually involves cytopenias. Class three might involve something like serum sickness reaction or serum sickness-like reaction, depending on whether there's end organ involvement. And then class four can have these dramatic and very serious skin reactions, um, like blistering reactions, mucocutaneous involvement, systemic involvement, like dress, um, liver injury, nephritis. But you can also have this really benign delayed maculopapular reaction or rash, sorry, that happens at like day 10 um, that's mediated by T cells. And like that benign rash is not a reason to avoid this class in the future. But if you any, have any of those other scary things that I mentioned, those are reasons to avoid um, this entire class of medications until you're seen by an allergist. So that need to avoid more broadly, that would apply to these delayed hypersensitivities. So let's move on to inpatient delabeling. Again, just to stress the, the importance of trying to figure out which bucket your patient or perhaps your own reaction falls into. And for the remainder of our short time together, I'm going to talk about type one or these immediate reactions. Um, so the traditional testing that I think many of us have heard of before involves three steps. There's a skin test, an intradermal test, and then the gold standard is a challenge. So an oral challenge if it's an oral antibiotic or an IV challenge if it's an IV antibiotic. Um, and I think there's this um, conception that the skin test is the end all and be all, but really it's the challenge with the offending or the suspected offending agent that is the gold standard for confirming or ruling out whether you truly have a drug hypersensitivity. Um, there's lots of limitations. There's a lack of availability of the reagent. So when you look at the high negative predictive value of skin testing, that really applies to penicillin um, and some cephalosporins and ampicillin because of what's available. Um, there's a lack of specificity for skin testing when you're talking about benign rashes like maculopapular rashes that develop you know, after five days of antibiotics. Um, these tests are painful, perhaps more relevant on the pediatric side and time consuming because sometimes you have to come back for multiple visits and I think we can do better. Um, recent studies, so back, it's a bit old now, 2017, um, 
indicating that there are, there's a movement to incorporate inpatient penicillin testing more broadly in hospitals um, and having non-allergists facilitate that testing. This is a much more recent systematic review from um, 2023, but they looked at uh, databases up to 2022 and non-allergy specialists providing this service. Um, up to 15% of people talked about history alone. Up to 30% of trials looked at drug, oh, sorry, a direct drug provocation test, and 41% um, looked at skin testing followed by drug provocation tests. So the, we're 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 progressing. We're moving. Um, these are the different types of things you can ask about on the history to try to fine tune what you're asking about. Details about the event, um, or like why the antibiotics were started in the first place. Uh, what was going on at that time, details of the reaction, and what happened subsequently in terms of management and any antibiotic use. Just picking out the elements that are kind of what I would consider low risk. Um, if it's an oral antibiotic, there are no symptoms of anaphylaxis, no systemic symptoms, and it's a benign rash that occurred 24 hours later. Again, the focus here is ruling out with history, um, serious delayed hypersensitivities, and um, uh, type 1 IgE mediated. And just like to state the obvious, these um, responses here in this box um, are, I would consider someone not allergic. So they're not even low risk. I would consider this not allergic. Um, we are moving towards direct oral challenges. I think the vast majority of data was established on the pediatric side um, in the outpatient allergy clinics where they looked at the safety of going straight to a direct oral challenge for penicillins and amoxicillin. Um, they looked in the eMERGE setting in terms of interviewing parents. The vast majority of what parents report are low risk. And then they saw them in the allergy clinic later. And then all of them went on to successfully tolerate oral challenges. Um, there's more recent data from the inpatient setting. Um, there's a couple studies that come to mind. Uh, one was like a quality improvement study by Bauer and colleagues looking at the Gen Peds ward. Um, during my um, additional clinical fellowship where I focused just on antimicrobial stewardship, we also looked at a prospective um, program to delabel patients that were low risk on the inpatient pediatric ward. Um, and in our experience, we were able to expand that beyond penicillin, amoxicillin to oral cephalosporins like cephalexin, cefuroxine as well. And on the adult side, there's this um, clinical scoring tool called PenFast, um, where you can ask these questions and try to risk stratify adults. Um, and there are um, observational studies of uh, adult groups using direct oral challenge to successfully delabel people. Um, this was, you know, exciting news. It was an RCT multi-center international where they compared skin testing and uh, direct oral challenge in those with a PENFAST score lower than three. And they found that they were equally safe and efficacious. Um, so an oral challenge, just to kind of briefly overview, the first step is making sure that um, you get their, um, you do their vitals, that there's no rash or respiratory uh, symptoms at that time or contraindications. You have a couple options for what you can do for the direct oral challenge. And then sometimes this is the entire dose or sometimes you split it into two, and then you monitor them for 60 minutes thereafter. And then you counsel the families or the patients about what happens after they have hopefully and expectedly a successful oral challenge where they have no reaction at all. Um, next steps, okay, I'm after, I'm, af I'm getting close, here we go. <laughs> Don't want to take away from uh, David's time. So um, our next steps, we're looking at implementing this at McMaster Children's Hospital. This is probably the aspect that I'm most excited to share this morning. So allergists alone, cannot take on this public health issue by themselves. There's increasing awareness of the harm and burden of inappropriate beta-lactam um, allergies. Um, there just aren't enough allergy specialists to, to tackle all of these demands for formal investigations. And so we need to engage and empower other clinicians to perform these beta-lactam allergy assessments so that we can facilitate broader access. So multidisciplinary engagement is important. This could be internal medicine specialists, pediatricians, nurses, 
pharmacists, um, antimicrobial stewardship programs, inpatient, outpatient. So there's so many opportunities to increase access. Um, and I think what's really important is this decreases barriers. So um, families and patients don't have to make an appointment to get a referral. They don't have to wait for the referral. The, the waiting time, um, like at least at the start of the pandemic, was you know upwards of six to 12 months. For some of the non-acute or non-severe reactions, the wait times are similar still here in Hamilton. Um, uh, sometimes the city you're working with, working in, they might not have um, an allergist who's willing to do these um, skin tests and oral challenges unless they're in a hospital setting. Um, sometimes there are language barriers when you go to a uh, a clinic that is outside a hospital setting where they might not have the resources to provide provide interpreter services it takes time out of your schedule it takes time out of the kids school schedule so lots of barriers that we can remove by implementing these services more broadly um, and as i demonstrated with that third vignette i talked about at the beginning the toddler who had two bouts of pneumonia and subsequently many many episodes of otitis media before he got his tubes put in there are like immediate benefits to the care that they receive because you can impact antibiotic choice in hospital, but then there are short-term benefits too <clears throat> for future antibiotic use. Um, this probably projects kind of small, but um, this is kind of the, the clinical pathway um, that uh, I worked on at SickKids and that we've adapted for use here at McMaster Children's. So currently, um, or like as of 2022, it was really uh, restricted to ID consulted patients. So those that were on our, that we were following on service, we noticed they had a beta lactam allergy. They were on antibiotics most of the time, and so um, we were able to kind of offer kind of the assessment, the standardized history, and an oral challenge if it was appropriate. Um, and then if it wasn't, we liaised with our allergy um, colleagues. What we're moving towards is routine assessment um, by the pharmacist. And this is going to be a pharmacist-led intervention where they approach families of children who have a beta-lactam allergy on their um, um, electronic medical record or their EPIC chart. Um, the pharmacist will go ahead with the standardized history and provide standardized documentation in the chart so that everyone can see the details. They'll put some of the salient information in that allergy box where people might look when they're making decisions about antibiotic prescribing. And then we're going to move towards offering direct oral challenges for all of these families. Right now, we're just piloting this. It's on CTU, um, like imminently with the pharmacists about to go and start approaching families and take these um, standardized histories and offering oral challenges only if they're on antibiotics and it's going to affect antibiotics. But the dream is to move it towards offering oral challenges for all these families on CTU and then more broadly across the hospital. And then trying to expand our outpatient capacity to do these assessments as well, especially the low risk and um, team working and um, with our pediatric allergy colleagues and myself on the infectious diseases side. So with that, um, I know this is a little bit cheeky. Um, and as I said, I'm not, I definitely don't want to downplay the serious reactions that can happen to penicillin. But I think enough people are realizing that this is a public health issue, um, that most penicillin allergies are inaccurate. And this image was actually taken off of Amazon. So people are selling mugs like this. I think people are aware I think the time is now where we can do better with our antibiotic allergy um, assessment and approaches. Um, thank you so much for your time. My email's there. And if you have questions, uh, there's the Q&A and uh, maybe we'll have time for them at the end. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. That was super interesting. Uh, we'll, we'll turn it over to Dave now. Awesome. Thanks, Lori, uh, and thanks, Jacqueline, for kind of setting me up. Now, I'll admit that I was one of those 10% uh, of people who was uh, who had a rash once when I was a kid uh, because of a, penis, of a penicillin allergy, uh, you know, and, and I've kind of acted as my own allergist in a way uh, over the last, I guess, five or six years of working in, uh, in the lab with beta-lactam antibiotics, probably getting grams of and, and inhaling probably milligrams of dust of, of, of ampicillin over the years. So I think it's safe to say by now, uh, there hasn't been a reaction. So 
um, yeah, thanks for for bringing all that to light. So anyway, so I'll be primarily talking about um, the kind of molecular details of beta-lactam antibiotics today. Um, you know, the challenge of, of beta-lactam resistance and, 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 and decreased potency that we've been seeing over the years and some new research to, to come out of McMaster um, over the last, uh, and I guess, you know, year or so um, to try to enhance the efficacy of beta-lactam antibiotics. We'll also be talking about a new antibiotic that we've um, been working on in the lab, uh, in Jerry Wright's lab, um, that uh, can completely circumvent uh, the need for, for beta-lactam antibiotics um, and uh, overcome resistance to them. So uh, I'm going to kick it off with um, just a, a bit of a brief background. So beta-lactam antibiotics are one of our oldest antibiotics. They're a natural product produced by uh, penicillium. And as most of you know, uh, was discovered um, in the 1940s by Sir Alexander Fleming. And despite their age, uh, they're still the most valuable and widely used class of antibiotic because they're relatively cheap. They're also very chemically versatile. So you can make many different variants and modifications to the uh, beta-lactam scaffold relatively easily. Uh, another reason why they're so popular is because they're extremely potent. And the reason for this is because they target the bacterial cell wall. Um, and the bacterial cell wall is really an, an ideal target for beta-lactams as well as many other antibiotics because it's really the, I guess, the, the bacterial uh, skin or, or, or surface envelope that protects them from the outside environment as well as um, protects them from their own internal osmotic pressure within the cell. So this peptidoglycan is a single continuous molecule that wraps around and gives the cell its shape. Without it, they can't live. And it's composed of these glycan chains that I've shown here in blue that are cross-linked by these, these red peptides. Obviously, this is an oversimplified look of what they look like, but I think it kind of shows like a nice um, kind of schematic overview of, of, this, of this meshwork. And so the way that um, peptidoglycan is synthesized in the cell wall is, is relatively straightforward, but you know, there still is a bit of an oversimplific oversimplification. There are many enzymes that are involved, but in a nutshell, individual glycan chains are synthesized that contain these stem peptides and enzymes called transpeptidases connect these two adjacent strands. And so this creates that cross-link network that, uh, that is essential for, for bacterial survival. And so this stem peptide structure itself um, is unique in the sense that it contains this diala diala moiety. So this diala diala motif is uh, actually the substrate for the transpeptidases, which use this to, to connect uh, the adjacent glycan chains. And so beta-lactams being a natural product have evolved uh, this incredible uh, molecular mimicry mechanism where the beta-lactam itself looks a hell of a lot like the diala diala um, terminal peptide of the peptidoglycan. And by mimicking this, this, um, uh, this motif, beta-lactams actually bind to these transpeptidases, which have been appropriately named the penicillin binding proteins and modify them covalently and prevent them from interacting with the glycan chains, preventing the cross-linking from occurring. So what happens in a healthy cell when you inhibit synthesis, what happens is uh, uh, a process known as autolysis uh, uh, occurs. And, and this is because during normal bacterial growth and division, old peptidoglycan needs to be removed in order to insert new material. So when biosynthesis is stalled and peptidoglycan chains aren't cross-linked, this leaves these autolytic enzymes unregulated. They degrade the peptidoglycan and ultimately cause the bacteria to, to die. And I think this is um, kind of very well demonstrated here in this video with um, E. coli being exposed to beta-lactams over time. So you can see the cells growing, as cell wall biosynthesis is stalled, these autolysins weaken and make the cell wall more fragile and, and the cells kind of violently explode and rupture. And, and, this, and, and, and really, it, this is all because of, yeah, the, the action of penicillin and, and, and really speaks to, to the potency of this molecule and why the cell wall is such an important target. And so given this, the central importance of the cell wall, it's not surprising there are many various roots of, of beta-lactam resistance that occur uh, you know, this is a kind of a schematic of, of the gram negative cell envelope. You have an outer membrane, paraplasmic space where the peptidoglycan resides and, and, and an inner membrane. And so uh, the most the easiest, most intrinsic way of, of preventing beta-lactams is down, down regulating porins. This prevents them from even getting into the site where they're active, as well as efflux that pumps these, these molecules out. But what I'll be focusing primarily in this talk is um, on the beta-lactamases. So beta-lactamases are enzymes that confer resistance. There are some other examples um, like target modifications where 
um, certain bacteria have insensitive PVPs, but uh, that's a bit outside the scope of this talk for today, but, but is still very relevant. So among uh, the known resistance genes that confer um, uh, resistance to beta-lactams, uh, the majority are beta-lactamases. And, and the reason why beta-lactamases are so widespread is because they, they're extremely aggressive and, and efficient enzymes that catalyze a very simple reaction to inactivate beta-lactams. They, they hydrolyze the beta-lactam ring, which is the active uh, portion of the molecule, opening it up to make it um, and unable to interact with penicillin binding proteins. And so beta-lactamases are are, are they're, they're everywhere, but they're mostly a problem in gram-negative bacteria, in particular the Enterobacteriaceae. Um, and, and for this reason, um, many uh, gram-negatives uh, have landed their, or, or, or found their way onto the World Health Organization's um, uh, priority pathogen list because uh, they're, they become very difficult to treat uh, because of their ability to withstand beta-lactams. And so, of the, of the beta-lactamases that are known to occur, uh, there are two major types. There are serine beta-lactamases and metallobeta-lactamases, which differ both in structure and mechanism, which I'll kind of touch on later in, in the talk. But before I do, I, I just wanna kind of quickly talk about where this resistance came from and, and why we're kind of in the middle of this uh, beta-lactam resistance problem in the first place. And so it turns out that resistance has actually evolved with beta lactam development itself. And this, this, this started, um, you know, as early as the 1940s with the introduction of penicillin G. Shortly afterwards, narrow spectrum beta lactamases were discovered, which probably coexisted with the producers that uh, made penicillin G. In the 1960s, following the introduction of ampicillin, saw the uh, emergence of broad spectrum beta lactamases. And I think you get the, the point here, you know, these later generation carbapenems and, and cephalosporins uh, became quickly uh, um, susceptible to to new extended spectrum beta lactamases as well as carbapenemases, and I just want to draw attention specifically to the carbapenemases uh, because the, for the first time in the early two thousands, these genes became acquired, and carbapenemases are particularly problematic because they degrade carbapenems, which are in, in a lot of cases uh, reserved as drugs of last resort. Not only can they degrade carbapenems, but also all the other classes of beta-lactams that we have. And these uh, enzymes themselves can be broken down into three classes, B, or A, B, and B, which uh, includes some, some notable mentions such as KPC2 and the infamous NDM1. And as I mentioned, these are acquired, so that means that many of them are plasmid encoded, which means that uh, they're capable of being passed along through horizontal gene transfer between different bacteria. So this, this, the, the dissemination and spread of these resistance enzymes is, is kind of reached at a global scale. So uh, these are a, a big problem. So uh, as I mentioned, there are two main flavors of, of beta-lactamases. Um, carbapenemases, KPC, and OXA fall under the serine beta-lactamase family. Uh, these uh, contain a serine active site residue, which serves as a nucleophile to open up the beta-lactam ring. And it, this occurs through a, a covalent enzyme intermediate. We also have um, carbapenemases belonging to the metallo-beta-lactamase family, uh, which have a completely different mechanism involving two zinc ions, which uh, activate a water molecule into a hydroxide ion, which more or less hydrolyzes the, the beta-lactam ring in a single step. So given, I guess, the, the, the widespread nature and, and the, I guess, the effectiveness of these enzymes is in, in terms of their ability to confer beta-lactam resistance, uh, there's, there's clearly a need here to inhibit these enzymes to, to safeguard the beta-lactams that we currently use in the clinic. Uh, but unfortunately, because of the diversity in structures and mechanisms that we observe in beta-lactamases, identifying broad spectrum inhibitors is, is very challenging. Um, but that's not to say, you know, people haven't tried. Um, to date, there are several serine beta-lactamase inhibitors that uh, are in use and have been approved. Uh, one of the OGs is clavulanic acid. Uh, we also have uh, some of the more recent ones, avibactam. Uh, so these two covalently modify serine beta-lactamases. Uh, and, and a more recent uh, cyclic boronate compound called Vaberbactam has been approved, which doesn't covalently inhibit these enzymes, but um, it acts as a kind of like a transition state mimic to, to um, competitively in inhibit uh, the activity of serine beta-lactamases. 
So unfortunately, because of the differences in mechanism, serine beta-lactamase inhibitors uh, do not inhibit metal beta-lactamases. And for that reason, there have been separate screening campaigns to attempt to identify uh, compounds that target these enzymes. Unfortunately, uh, it's, you know, after many decades of research, not many have really seen the clinic. Um, one molecule called aspergillomerasmine A was discovered here at McMaster, which actually strips the metal ions. Uh, the bisthiazolidines uh, interact with these metal ions, and then the ANT2681 um, also interacts with the metal ions. So I think you can sense a theme here. Many of these molecules interact with the metal ions, and then as a result, don't affect serine beta-lactamases. But fortunately, recently, uh, cross-class beta-lactamase inhibitors have been discovered, at, which have shown promise, uh, such as zeruborbactam, zeru which is based on the uh, cyclic boronate scaffold, which just uh, completed phase one clinical trials, uh, as, well as, as well as taniborbactam, um, which uh, just completed a successful CUTI phase three. Um, so, uh, I think there is light at the end of the tunnel. Things look positive. I think we're on on route to to finding ways to to tackle these enzymes. Uh, but what history has taught us over time is that resistance is always inevitable, and, uh, and this is also true for the beta lactamase inhibitors because these beta lactamases um, have a tendency to also mutate and and um, kind of overcome uh, the uh, these inhibitors. And so, that being said, we kind of have to Keep ahead of the game. It's 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 turned into a bit of an arms race where we need to continue to, to find new inhibitors to uh, anticipate the inev inevitable. And so now I'm going to be telling you about a, a quick and short story uh, that's kind of unraveled here uh, at the IIDR, uh, which was inspired by ANT2681, uh, which is a metal beta lactamase inhibitor that I showed you in my last slide. So give you a bit more detail about how ANT2681 works. It's a competitive inhibitor of metal beta lactamases and here's the crystal structure of it here in yellow bound to the metal beta lactamase VIM2. And you'll notice that the interactions between this molecule and VIM2 primarily interact between the two zinc ions that are essential for catalysis and this occurs through the thiazole ring. So a few years ago, uh, Luke uh, Jaeger from the Burroughs lab, who primarily thinks about how to inhibit fo uh, folate biosynthesis, made this really interesting connection. Uh, Sulfothiazole, which inhibits one step within the folate po pathway, um, he noticed, looks very similar to ANT2681. It shares this thiazole ring, sulfon sulfonamide is similar, and, as well as this aniline. So this ANT2681 is really just like a decked out version of the sulfothiazole um, molecule. So we thought, well, maybe we can convert sulfathiazole into a, a metal beta lactamase inhibitor uh, and then maybe get some dual activity out of this molecule. So the nice thing about working in the IIDR is that you have know, expertise in medicinal chemistry, molecular biology, biochemistry, and we're all you know within arm's reach of each other. And so he reached out to Princeton uh, from the Magellan lab, who um, was, is a chemist, uh, and was able to... Um, create a sulfathiazole analog containing a carboxyl group to make it look more like this ANT2681 compound. Hopefully, um, by adding this molecule, we could um, encourage sulfathiazole to, uh, to interact with metal beta lactamases and inhibit them. And so that's where I stepped in, is to validate this molecule in vitro uh, in, uh, in, in, in um, metal beta lactamase inhibition assays. And so this is what these look like. Um, I tested this with um, NDM1 and VIM2 and their ability to um, hydrolyze the antibiotic neuropenem. So the residual activity is in the y-axis. So in the absence of antibiotic, they're 100% active. And across the x-axis here, we have the, um, the, the increasing concentrations of compound. I initially tested the sulfathiazole to see if this had any activity on its own. And it turns out it doesn't, which was expected. But MLLB2201, as you can see, just through the addition of that carboxyl group, suddenly is able to inhibit the activity of these enzymes uh, and is able to do so at low micromolar concentrations, which is really exciting um, and, and really encouraging. Um, and so to kind of get a better sense of, of how this inhibition was occurring, I have some preliminary structural data um, of MLLB2201 in complex with VIM2. And it turns out it has a very similar binding mode to ANT2681, which is not surprising, but validates the, the importance of this 
um, uh, carboxylated thiazole in inhibiting the enzyme. So we're really excited about this molecule, and, and hopefully uh, in, uh, in you know in the in the months and years to come, we can develop some some more potent analogs and, and see how they pan out. So I've shown you that um, MLLB um, can inhibit NDM1, but the question remains is, well, does it still inhibit folate biosynthesis? And it turns out that it has, you know, fairly weak activity on its own, but we wanted to see if it could synergize with trimethoprim, which hits a downstream step within the folate pathway. And the idea is here, if, if, if it does, then maybe we could see triple synergy with MLLB, meropenem, and trimethoprim. And we, so Luke evaluated this using checkerboard assays. So this is a checkerboard assay where here in gray is bacterial growth, white is, is death. You can see here across the y-axis, the MIC for trimethoprim is um, about 500 nanograms per mil. And uh, um, the MIC for meropenem is, is greater than 128. And this is E. coli. Uh, carbapenem resistant E. coli because it's producing NDM1. And all of these boxes in the middle are different combinations of these, of these two molecules. So what we saw was with increasing concentrations of, of MLLB shown here in, in, in colors, the effective amount of either meropenem or trimethoprim was reduced to the point where um, we saw this uh, triple synergy effect and um, kind of in sum, uh, this suggested that MLLB is, is really a, a bona fide dual inhibitor because it increases the potency of trimethoprim about 16 fold and increases the potency of meropenem 64 fold. So um, I think at this point, um, you know, there's, there's still some work to be done to maybe improve its um, uh, potency towards uh, inhibiting the folate pathway, but it's a, it's a really interesting and, and exciting start. So I'm looking forward to see how, how this project progresses. So up until now, I've primarily been focused on gram-negative bacteria, beta-lactamases, but uh, I don't want to uh, ignore the gram-positives uh, because many of these are also very um, important clinically. So in addition to making uh, beta-lactamases, many gram-positive bacteria actually uh, produce resistant penicillin binding proteins, which don't bind to beta-lactam antibiotics, as well as contain various cell wall modifications, which enables them to kind of intrinsically tolerate these antibiotics. And for this reason, beta-lactamase inhibitors are not always effective at treating um, beta-lactam resistant gram positives like um, MRSA. Uh, and so um, I think there's a need to really drive research into discovering new non-beta-lactam antibiotics that target the cell wall uh, in a different way to not only circumvent resistance, but give us new modes of action to, to help uh, curb this issue. And so... Uh, for the next couple of slides here, um, I'm going to be talking about a, a molecule um, that was discovered in the Wright lab that, that does just this. Uh, the molecule is called corbamycin, which um, was discovered um, through genome mining. It's uh, kind of a vancomycin analog. Um, it contains the, the typical uh, kind of cross-linked peptide structure that you see in vancomycin with, with some notable differences. So the interesting thing about corbamycin is that it's able to kill methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus uh, at one microgram per mil and, and has efficacy similar to that of vancomycin. But what's even more exciting about corbamycin is in addition to overcoming beta-lactam resistance, it also overcomes vancomycin resistance. As you can see here with this vancomycin-resistant strain of S. aureus, it has an eight-fold uh, better MIC or eight-fold more potent. Not only does it work against Staph aureus, but it's also able to kill um, vancomycin-resistant enterococci, uh, which many of which are you know, intrinsically resistant to beta-lactam. So you can see here a quite striking improvement in the uh, in the potency of, uh, of corbamycin relative to vancomycin towards enterococcus fecalis and BCM. So uh, this, is, this is quite uh, quite an impressive uh, um, quite an impressive uh, feat here. So given that it's able to overcome uh, vancomycin resistance, we and as well as beta-lactam resistance, we're interested in how this molecule actually worked because clearly whatever it was doing was distinct from that of vancomycin. And what we saw was when we treated either Bacillus subtilis or Staph aureus with um, corbamycin, we saw that cells kind of underwent these really interesting morphological changes. Whereas corbamycin caused Bacillus to grow in these long chains, Staph aureus grew in these kind of clumps. And if you look a little closer, you can see that these cells can grow, but they're unable to actually separate from one another. 
they can't degrade their cell wall at the points of, of division. So they kind of stay stuck together, which uh, results in a bacteriostatic effect. And the reason for this is it turns out that um, corbamycin binds to the cell wall. So this is a, a, a pretty straightforward binding assay where we incubate the, cell, the peptidoglycan of Staph aureus with um, corbamycin and then detect how much corbamycin is left in solution. And we can monitor this by HPLC. You can see this peak slowly disappear with increasing ratios of cell wall to the glycopeptide or, or corbamycin. Um, so furthermore, we were able to label corbamycin with a fluorescent uh, um, with a fluorescent moiety, and then show directly that corbamycin binds to the surface of whole cells. So these are whole cells of Bacillus subtilis. You can see here they're glowing nice and green uh, as a result of corbamycin binding. And this turns out to be cell wall dependent because when you remove the cell wall from Bacillus and generate spheroplasts, which are basically just membrane vesicles, we get no labeling showing the specificity of this molecule. So how does how does it work? How does carbamycin binding to peptidoglycan inhibit bacteria from dividing and separating? So the as I mentioned earlier in my talk, there are enzymes called autolysins that um, uh, degrade the peptidoglycan to separate uh, bacterial cells. And, and with treatment uh, with, with cell wall biosynthesis inhibitors, um, this actually induces autolysis, like I showed you in the earlier slide. And this can also be induced by phosphomycin and ramaplanin, which you see here. So this is a culture um, optical density. And you can see following the uh, addition of, of either of these antibiotics, you can see the optical density dropping because the cells are exploding. So what we see is in the presence of corbamycin, this phenotype is suppressed. So it turns out, based on this data, that uh, carbamycin binds the peptidoglycan and prevents autolysins from accessing their, their substrate. So we were able to show this in living bacteria as well as in vitro with um, peptidoglycan degradation assays. So there's a very similar premise to this, except this is using purified peptidoglycan and purified enzymes. You can see here, the as the degradation of the cell wall occurs, its optical density decreases for both. And in the presence of carbamycin, this is suppressed. So uh, let's see, I'm running out of time here. But overall, the mechanism of corbamycin, we think, is um, during cell division, corbamycin binds dividing cells, prevents them from degrading the peptidoglycan near the binding site, preventing them from separating, resulting in this bacteriostasis. And so this is really exciting because now we can start guiding synthesis of analogs of corbamycin now we, that we know its mechanism and make more potent analogs, better understand structure activity relationship and potency. Uh, we can now better predict resist self-resistance to how this molecule works because it is a natural product. And I mean, maybe we can also use it as, a, as an interesting chemical probe to better understand the biology of bacteria uh, and, and antibiotic resistance. And so with this, I'll just quickly summarize. I've shown you, I think, that beta-lactams are very widely used and are an important class of antibiotics. Uh, resistance can be achieved through several ways, but beta-lactamases represent the major mechanism. Inhibiting these enzymes is a valid approach to restore the efficacy of beta-lactams. I've shown you what we've done here at McMaster, uh, kind of uh, spearheading this issue using a dual inhibitor strategy. And then finally, an example of a non-beta-lactam antibiotic that targets a cell wall um, that overcomes resistance to both um, beta-lactams as well as vancomycin. So with that, I'll end here. I just want to acknowledge uh, you know, the, the lab, uh, and in uh, particular, Luke Yeager from the Burroughs Lab, as, as well as Princeton, um, who, uh, who helped push those projects along. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dave. It's very cool to hear about the, the work that you guys did. Uh, the paper is under review, so let's all keep our fingers crossed. Um, and now we'll get to the questions. So I, I know Jacqueline's been answering some of them in the background by text just to save some time. Um, so we'll get to the ones that are left. So uh, there's a question for not me, but Jacqueline. Um, have you faced issues with educating other healthcare workers for labeling patients with certain allergies and attacking the problem from its roots? Yeah, I would say that I haven't. Um systematically approached it, but I think the concept of addressing the root cause is really important, like rather than trying to catch the water, like just turn off the faucet kind of thing. And so kind of thinking through how we can um, expand 
beta lactam allergy delabeling efforts and rethink what that looks like. Um, education that's geared towards um, healthcare providers is really important too. That's a really important question and comment. Thank you. I feel like uh, beta lactam allergy is uh, one of these urban urban myths. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next question for Jacqueline. Um, have you found that parental fear is a barrier for having children undergo oral allergy testing despite its usefulness in diagnosing an allergy? How is this typically addressed? Yeah, I I would imagine so. And then I have a, a slightly different um, viewpoint on this um, because I, I'm not an allergist. Um, but when we were rolling out this program at SickKids and we looked at how many families were hesitant to uh, get this addressed in hospital and and the way I, I marketed it was like, you know, like you're, you're hooked up to a monitor all the time versus in the clinic, you're getting like spot checks. You're not hooked up to a monitor all the time. There's like, like people can see like you have nurses around everywhere and physicians, et cetera. Um, so the vast majority of uh, patients who are eligible, I would say 75% of the fans are, oh yeah, let's get done here. Um, and then the minority um, decline and they decline. Half of those who decline were because they already had a referral to an allergist and they're like, oh, I'll just wait. Um, and then the other half were, um, it was a combination of they're like, ah, I'm not sure if I'm ready or, you know, this is not the setting that they were um, in their mind, they thought would be where like a, an allergy would be addressed. So there is some hesitation from the parent side, but I think even just starting that conversation, having it like in their discharge summary or something like that, so that it can be revisited in the future, um, rather than just be left until that point when someone needs an antibiotic prescription. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is a question for Dave. Uh, Melissa says, great talk. Are there any toxicity concerns with corbamycin as in as seen in preliminary testing? Great question. So I, I can't speak to toxicity. I think people in the lab have tested it. Um, from my memory, I, I, I haven't heard of, of any toxicity uh, associated with the molecule, but one issue that we do know of is that it does tend to be bound by serum very well. So it binds to serum protein, so it's not very bioavailable. So um, we're working on trying to make analogs of, of, or of corbamycin and, and related molecules to, to try to uh, reduce that binding and maybe um, improve the bioavailability. So thank you. Uh, I actually have a question about corbamycin as well. Um, I, I know autolysins auto are super important, yet kind of redundant when you do molecular analyses, right? So you can delete individual autolysins mm -hmm. and still have viability. So is it is it working similar to a beta-lactam in that it's inhibiting multiple enzymes simultaneously and that's why you see this impact on growth? Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, Staph aureus has, I think like uh, just under 20 autolysins. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think uh, that's exactly how it's working. It's binding to the cell wall, kind of coating it, carpeting, uh, the nooks and crannies um, throughout the entire surface. And uh, and then by doing that, it's blocking accessibility to, to all of these enzymes, uh, including redundant enzymes. And I think, you know, it, it could probably, it might be going a, a bit further beyond just inhibiting autolysis, but other enzymes that are important for um, assembling the cell wall. Some work um, recently that came out of Georgina Cox's lab at Guelph shows that um, these molecules actually prevent the attachment of adhesins to the surface of Staph aureus mm -hmm. and prevents them from sticking to epithelial cells. So it's doing, yeah, whatever it is, it's pleiotropic. It's doing a lot of things um, that's messing up the homeostasis of the cell wall. And I think uh, is great for from the standpoint of uh, an antibiotic because it means that the development of resistance will be a bit more difficult to, to occur exactly. rather than targeting one target, yeah. Well, we, we sure need new drugs. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm very excited about that. So I, I'm going to cut it off here just for the sake of time. So thank you both for super interesting talks. And thank you to our audience for tuning in. We will see you next month, uh, March 6th.